All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim, one of the pastors here. Good to have you. Uh, welcome. If you're new, we are in, uh, I suppose it's the third week now of our, uh, what we've just called Unshaken, our six-week series called Unshaken. It's a six-week series, uh, but it's the start, the launch of a two-year uh, discipleship uh, direction for us as a church. And so uh, six weeks for the next two years, kind of a big deal for us. And so I, I do want to bring your attention to one uh, important uh, announcement, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Uh, on November 8th, which by the way is my birthday, November 8th, here soon, uh, it, we will have uh, what we're calling Advanced Commitment Night. Uh, and so this is a night where uh, all of the, the leaders and anyone who is ready, uh, anyone who wants to, uh, will uh, dedicate, consecrate, and commit to the next two years of what God is calling us to do as a church. In uh, 1 Chronicles 29, uh, David is doing that. He is uh, going first and then calling his leaders to go with him uh, in the, uh, the, the dedication of, uh, in, that, in that scenario, it was the temple. Uh, and so for us, as the temple of uh, the living God now in the New Testament, we are the temple. Uh, we're going to go first. And, and so uh, when it comes to just consecrating, dedicating ourselves uh, for the next two years to uh, all the things that we've talked about, if you're new, some of this might be new, but uh, what it looks like for us to be an unshaken family. Uh, both at home and, and here at, uh, as, a, as a church. What does that look like? We want to consecrate ourselves and just say, we're going to set the Lord before us at our right hand that my family at home and my family at church would be unshaken despite the craziness of the world. Uh, and there's some things that we're going to be pursuing in all of that and, and, and desiring in all of that, but we're going to start with dedicating ourselves to the Lord. Unshaken presence, which we'll talk about today. Unshaken mission, the mission of God that cannot be shaken. Every other mission, every other thing you might be about uh, is fine. It's just not as good or permanent or better or than the kingdom of God. Uh, and so we're going to dedicate ourselves to that, commit our, our lives, our finances, our energies, just literally our whole self to that. And it's going to start with me and my wife, uh, the elders and their wives, uh, they only have one wife, you know what I mean, right? Not their wives, but, you know, uh, our significant others, <laughs> uh, and then all the other leaders of the church, and anyone can be a part of that. We, we want, you, you are a leader if you're willing to say, I'm in. I'm going to do this, and I'm in. Okay, so that's November 8th. That's my birthday. That's my birthday gift. Come, be a part of that. Uh, it's going to be a very special, sacred, joyful uh, evening, and so want you to be a part of, of that. Now, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the life of David in light of uh, the, this unshaken journey over the next two years. We wanted to look at the life of David because you can look at, like he was a man after God's own heart. That's what God said about him. I want that. I, I, want, I want that to be said about me. Uh, but we can look at his life and, and the events of his life, but then we can also look at his heart through the Psalms. And so I love that. I think that's unique in that we can look at uh, this biblical character and what he did and, you know, much of what he did was not good, and some of what he did was good, but then we can look at also his heart in all of that through the Psalms. And so we've already talked about David learning to trust God, David learning how to surrender to God. Today, we're going to talk about David seeking the presence of God. And so here, here's my question for us this morning, and I want you to think twice before you answer your heart on this question, okay? Um, have you ever actually been in the presence of God? Have you actually been, have you, have you tasted of the, have you experienced actually the presence of God? Has that ever been an experience for you in your, uh, wherever you are on your life of faith? I know we're all on different journeys at different steps, different places in our, our, our journey. Have you ever experienced the presence of God? Have you ever found yourself in the tangible presence of God where you actually can feel it? Or you can sense the presence of God? Uh, my, my favorite, uh, definition of preaching is from Martin Lloyd-Jones, that uh, preaching is to give men, men and women, the, the, a sense of God in his presence. That's what preaching should be. Have you ever sensed God's presence, felt God's presence in any sort of way where you, maybe you heard his voice or you knew that you were on holy ground? Whatever it was, you, 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 you were one way a minute ago, but now you're a different way and the difference was the presence of God. Have you ever experienced that? Has that been a part of uh, your, your walk of faith? Um, I'm uh, no one special, uh, though I know most of you only know me as the guy with the face mic. So I imagine that some of you think I'm, you know, spiritual or something. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. 
Uh, I am an ex-jock preacher with no seminary degree, no college degree. I have no business doing this at all. Uh, and I certainly have no business in the presence of God. And yet, I have, I've had dozens, probably hundreds of times now, where I've felt and sensed the presence of God. Uh, where um, I've been on my knees in prayer, and it wasn't just me on my knees in prayer, God was there. Uh, where, where moments in worship with you, right here uh, on a Sunday, uh, one of the things I was doing this uh, podcast recently, and, and he was asking, he was asking me this question, and he was, it was essentially like, how do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you grow? How do you um, uh, practice God's presence? How do you, you know, that that kind of stuff? And I said, one thing I don't think most pastors uh, experience is I actually love coming to my church. Uh, when I come to my church and worship, I sing every song of every service, every word with you because I need it too. Like in this place with you, many, many times I've felt the presence of God. Um, I, I've, I've, uh, there's been times where God has given me his compassion for someone else and I've felt, I've felt the heart of God in me for someone else. That is not my, if you know me, that is not my bent. Empathy is not my spiritual gift. But God, some of you, Jordan, you can't laugh that loud at that. <laughs> but I felt the presence of God and had a certain compassion for people. Um, I've heard God speak to my heart in profound ways. I've physically felt the spirit of God overwhelm me. I have heard God say, I'm going to heal you, and then God healed me. Right? These are moments where I've had, I've felt, I've sensed the actual presence of God. And I'm jealous for you that you would have moments like that. Uh, most of my Christian life and most of your Christian life will just be lived by faith. There'll be ordinary Christian moments where we read God's word and we obey, right? Most of the Christian life, it's walking by faith in the valley, believing that God is true, believing that God is right, trusting in him, right? We, we, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We believe that God has raised him from the dead. We have assurance of salvation in Christ alone, by faith alone. We're in the valley just saying, I believe this to be true, but every once in a while you get on the mountaintop and God is there. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever felt like you were in the presence of God? God's presence in David's life, he would, he would seek it. Now, I wanted to talk about this because David is, I mean, that's what the Psalms are. It's him seeking the face of God. David was seeking God's presence. Why was this adulterer, this murderer, uh, this uh, many, many times not a great guy called a man after God's own heart is because he sought God's heart. Even in his sin, even in his brokenness, even in all of his, you know, you know, he had like, uh, I can't even count how many wives he had. Even in all of that, he was seeking God's presence. And so I wanted to talk about this because David all over is seeking God's presence. But two, it's part of our vision over the next two years, that we would seek the unshaken presence of God. That, that over the next two years, we would, we would um, press down on the pedal, the gas pedal of, of what we've been trying to do, uh, really the, you know, all 13 years as a church, but especially over the last five, six, seven, or eight, where we are seeking the power of and presence of God by his spirit. Uh, we're 24 seven prayer, prayer meetings, spiritual gifts, worship nights, uh, in this space every Sunday morning, just saying, uh, we don't wanna just play the American church game. Or we just go to church and we do the kids ministry and we sing some songs and, and we take of some, you know, gluten-free crackers and, and, you know, cheap wine and, and, and we just call it church. Uh, that we weren't gonna do that. That's not gonna be the kind of church that we're going to be. You can be very successful as an American church just playing the church game. But what if we sought the power and presence of God and asked him to break through? Uh, and actually experienced all that God would have for us. And so needed to talk about this because it's a part of our next two years and, and, and our focus, our vision for that. But then three, the reason why I wanted to talk about this, and, and especially, uh, you know, especially to just warm my heart in prayer for you and for us this past week, I just feel a divine jealousy that, that you would know him in this way. My fear, and, and, and correspondingly, my hope for us uh, but my fear is that many of you have actually never experienced the presence of God. You've done church, but you've never actually been in the presence of God in such a way that you felt, you felt him there. There was a sense that he was there and, 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 and it, it overwhelmed you in a way uh, that you came out of that different. It changed you. 
Uh, the Christian life, it shouldn't be boring. And for many of you, the Christian life has been quite boring. And so I have a divine jealousy for you to experience God's presence today. Um, and so we're gonna look at David seeking God's presence. Here's what we're gonna learn, three things. Um, the, the fear of God in his presence, okay? Uh, our response, there's two different responses we see in this text to the presence of God. And then finally, that we seek the presence of God. We are to seek, we have to, we must seek the presence of God, right? So fear, our response, and our seeking. First, the fear of uh, the presence of God. In, in chapter six, uh, in verse one, David, he gathers all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. This is gonna be a big deal for him. And he, he arose and he went with all the people who were with him from uh, Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. That's a lot of spiritual language. What does that mean and what is David doing? Uh, he sits, God sits enthroned on the cherubim of this ark. Of course, he's talking about the ark of the covenant. And this is where God's presence uh, was most uniquely felt. This is where God's presence would be. Uh, Saul has died, the, the king before David. Saul has died. David has finally taken the throne after years of running from him. And his first executive order is to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the city. It was sort of on the outskirts of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and and that, was, that was symbolic of where God's presence was in the minds and hearts of God's people in Israel, just kind of on the outskirts. And he said, no, the, the worship of God, the presence of God needs to be central to us. I wanna bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city, into Jerusalem, and I wanna make that central to who we are as a people. There was no temple yet. In fact, next chapter, he's gonna start desiring to build that. There's no temple yet. And so God's presence, his glory, uniquely resided in this Ark of the Covenant. Uh, if you remember some of the Bible story, this uh, began back in uh, the Exodus. When God had delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt, he tells Moses as they're wandering in the wilderness on their way to the promised land, I want you to build an ark. Uh, you're gonna build this ark. He says, I want you to take up an offering from the people, quote, everyone whose heart moves them to give. Uh, and I want you to build me this sort of traveling sanctuary, this traveling temple, so that where, where you go, I will go. Where you go, my temple, my, my, my presence, my glory, would go. And so I want you to build this ark. Uh, and it wasn't like an ark ark. It was a, it was a chest. It was a box uh, about four feet long, about two feet wide, and about two feet tall. Uh, and this uh, ark, it was made up of three sort of pieces. You had the actual box, and in the box, uh, the Ten Commandments went, and a, a jar of manna. And then on top of the box, sort of the cover is what's called the mercy seat. And then you had a, kind of attached to that were these two cherubim, these two angels, uh, and all of it was overlaid in gold. This was the Ark of the Covenant. And God says in Exodus 25, there I will meet with you. Right? This is my place, my temple. This is where uh, my presence will uniquely be. And then they were to put two rings on each side of the box and then slide two poles through it. And then priests to carry the, the Ark with them as they were traveling would pick up the poles of the ark and put it on their shoulders. That was how they were to transport it. And the ark was sort of a microcosm of the future temple and a microcosm of the tabernacle. Uh, the, you know, Solomon's temple, if you know anything about it, it had three main meeting areas. It had the courtyard, right, where anyone could sort of gather outside of the temple. Uh, then you had the holy place. When you stepped into the temple, only the priests could go there. And then you had the most holy place, and only the high priest could go into that place, uh, and then only one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And it was in that holy of holies where the ark was, and that was where God's unique presence, unique power resided. And, and so the, the, the ark of the covenant sort of corresponds to that. The box itself was the outer courtyard. Uh, the mercy seat is kind of like the, whole, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the holy place. And then the cherubim is sort of like the holy of holies. And all of that, think about this, is corresponding to Mount Sinai. God's people, you know, gather at Mount Sinai. The base of the mountain is where all of God's people would be. Up on the mountain a little bit is where the priests and the elders would go to be in the presence of God. And at the top of the mountain, the holiest place is where Moses would go to receive the word of God. 
All of this corresponds to heaven and earth. The earth is like the box. It's like the outer courtyard of the temple. The heavens, the stars, the moon, that is like the holy place. And then the holiest of holies would be what we might call heaven. All of this is just these, uh, you know, different grades of experiencing the presence of God. Right? We can walk around on earth, experience the presence of God, or heaven can come down and we can really experience the presence of God. That was the idea. And so the Ark of the Covenant, this is where God's presence was. And, and the big idea is that this is a big God and the Ark is a big deal. And God, David wanted God's presence to be central for his people. And so he begins to bring it back to Jerusalem. Verse three, and then they carried the Ark of God on a new cart, right? They had that new cart smell uh, and brought it out of the house of uh, Abinadab, which was on the hill in Azusa and we'll just call him Ohio. Uh, the sons of Abinadab were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ohio went before the Ark. Verse 5, and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. This was very appropriate. Right? This was a time of rejoicing and worship. It says with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and ca uh, cassonets and, and, and cymbals. Right? This place was rocking. They were bringing 30,000 people, big church, right? This is mega church. And they're bringing the cart, the, the, the ark, and, and they're singing, and they're playing instruments, and it's really loud. And this was very appropriate because this is the presence of God coming back into the city. Now, certainly there were some people in the congregation that wished that the music was a little bit quieter, you know, and that they weren't banging the cymbals so loud. Uh, certainly there was, a, you know, a few people with tucked in tunics, you know, and Patagonia vestments uh, that were, you know, a little nervous about, uh, uh, you know, David being a little too charismatic and wanted him to kind of, you know, tuck it in a little bit. Uh, but this was an appropriate response to uh, only, <laughs> I won't, uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I will say this, like I've seen grown men, okay, clap and cheer and lose their minds as younger, more in shape uh, grown men uh, play around with the ball and tights, okay? I've seen that, I've seen that. And then come to church the next morning with zero uh, to little emotion at all. That there's an appropriate response to things. There's an appropriate response to cheering for, did Texas Tech do okay last, yesterday? What happened? Yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't even, I didn't notice. I didn't notice what happened to Tech. Yeah, TCU won. That's right. Yeah. There's an appropriate response to a TCU comeback. And there's a, an appropriate response to the presence of God. To the, to the presence of God. And this is an appropriate response. But then... Tragedy strikes, verse six. Verse six, and when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Uh, does this offend you? Does this offend you? It scares me, but I understand why some might be offended by this event. That Uzzah, just doing his job, carrying the ark, reaches out to touch it, and God kills a man during a worship service. Is that offensive to you? Uh, obviously, this needs some explanation. Let me try to give it to you uh, in, in the short time that we have. Um, one, and this might offend you a little bit more, but hang with me, God kills everyone. Okay, God kills everyone. Uh, that's just the reality. Like, that, 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 that's what happens. Uh, this doesn't negate human freedom or human responsibility, um, but you and I have the breath in our lungs uh, because God says so. Uh, that our heart beats because God says so, and our brain weighs fire because God says so, and one day all of us will breathe out our last because God says so. That, that God is over all things. He gives life and he takes life away. That God gives and takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, we're not dealing with the sky fairy here. This is the most high God. All right, we have breath in our lungs because God says so. One day we won't because God says so. God kills everyone. Uh, Hebrews 1 uh, says that Jesus, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That, that the universe functions is is you know, being a universe right now, uh, universe, one voice. And that one voice that holds up the universe is God's, right? So all things are because God says so. Uh, but two, God told them this would happen. 
right? So in his grace, God reveals himself to us. In his grace, he speaks to us. And in his grace, he said, he told them, if you touch this, you will die. He said, I'm gonna manifest myself through this ark, but my presence is dangerous. Uh, I'm a holy God, you are a sinful people. And so in Numbers 4, verse 15, he says, you must not touch the holy things lest they die. Right? That, that's why he had the ring and the ark and the poles, and that's how you had to hold it. it that's why he had those things. Uh, I, I was told this years ago by a, a, a mentor, pastor friend. He said, sometimes pastors, we have a tendency to handle holy things too lightly, right? Where we preach and it's like, it's not a serious, solemn, sacred moment. And you just kind of go through the motions. That's handling holy things too lightly. That's why I said I'm scared. This doesn't offend me, it scares me, right? We come and we take up the Lord's Supper and, and it's just kind of flippant in what we do. We, we walk into a place set apart for the worship of God and we, we sit in this place and it's flippant. We handle this holy thing too lightly. But that's, that's, what, that's what's happening there, right? He says, no, 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 um, God is holy. Nothing unholy can ever enter his presence. This is kind of a big deal. Back before David, even, even before Saul was king, the Israelites, they had lost this ark to the Philistines, right? So they had lost it to the Philistines, their enemies, and so the Philistines knew the ark was a big deal. And so they take the ark and they're celebrating that they had gotten this ark and they put it in the temple to one of their gods, D Dagon or Dagon or whatever it is. So they put the ark, this is a great story, put it into this temple and then they go to bed. And then they wake up in the morning and they walk into the temple and the statue of Dagon is on the floor bowing before the ark of God. And so they're like, that's... That's weird, but you know, just, you know, quit, you know, something happened. They pick up the statue and then they go to bed that night and they wake up the next morning and they walk into the temple and not only has the, te the, the statue of Dagon fallen back down on its face, but now its head is cut off. All right, so that freaked them out a little bit. And so they sent the Ark of the Covenant to another city uh, in, in their, in their, in their, you know, under their rule in their nation. And then that city, everyone started getting tumors. And so that really freaked them out. So they just sent it back to Israel. They said, you keep it. Right, you keep this thing. Right, this is a, this is a, the, the presence of God is mighty. The presence of God is fearful. And if you think that this is somehow just an, another example of, you know, of the vengeful Old Testament God, but then he chills out when he, we get to the New Testament, we get to Jesus, you should think again. It's just not, you, you haven't read your Bible yet, right? Has anyone remembered Paul's teaching on taking the Lord's Supper? Now, if we don't examine ourselves, we don't repent of sin before we take it, he says in 1 Corinthians 11, if anyone eats, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, without examining yourself, eats and drinks judgment on himself, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. That some have died because they have taken of the Lord's Supper without, like, heaping judgment, without, they, they're handling holy things too lightly. Or how about this story in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira? This is a long, long text, but it's, it's interesting to read. Um, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. It's quite the ministry, right? You're on that team. Verse seven, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together with your husband to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And yeah, great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
And I think, I wonder if this is why some of you don't actually want to be in the presence of God. You know, you know, there's a sense in you, you know, like Ecclesiastes 3, God has set eternity into the hearts of men, right? There's something in all of us, Christian or not, that knows that God is scary. And that if we were to be in the presence of God, that might be too fearful for us, right? And so we hold God at arm's length. We keep him, I wanna I actually put in my notes, like watch your tone here. Let me be pastoral here and not too prophetic. Um, some of you are afraid to be in the presence of God because you know that if you do, things in your life would have to change and you don't want to change. And I'm here to just say the presence of God is better than anything that you're holding on to. But you haven't tasted of it, you don't know him, you don't really, you know about God, you don't really know God because you're holy, you haven't done the surrender thing yet. You haven't let go of something because you know if you came, actually came into the presence of God, he would say, I love you, this is better, but listen to me, that's gotta go. The unholy thing has to go. And some of you wanna hold on to the un unholy thing. And so you're too afraid to draw near to God because you know this is a big God and, and there's big fear associated with his presence. This is why we talked about trusting God first in the first week and surrendering to God last week because that is necessary before we come into the presence, truly come into the presence of God. The presence of God is great and beautiful. But yeah, he's gonna call you to change some things because to be in his presence, only holy things are. Uh, Tolkien, he called it the fear of the beautiful. We're actually more terrified by the beautiful thing. Uh, the ugly thing, the, the evil thing, uh, it might be scary, but it's not as scary as the beautiful and holy thing because the beautiful and holy thing paralyzes us and demands that we change. The, the scary, ugly thing, we just wanna run away. But the beautiful thing, we can't leave its presence when we're in it, but other things have to go. And so there's this fear of God and fear of his presence. One more thing about this. I thought this insight was really helpful. In verse eight, in verse eight, there, there's, there's this word that's used that, that is translated break out in, in chapter six here. In the chapter before it, it's translated breakthrough. It, it can be translated either way. So here, here's the literal translation of, of chapter six, verse eight. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out, paras, broken out uh, with an outbreak against Uzzah, and that place is called outbreak of Uzzah to this day. Um, in the previous chapter, David had defeated the Philistines, his enemies, and he uses that same language, but it's translated breakthrough. And David came to the Lord of breakthrough, uh, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Through the, uh, therefore, the name of that place is called the Lord of Breakthrough. Here, here's the idea. The same, right, the same holy and mighty God that breaks out against sin will break through in our lives. It all depends on how we respond to him. Right? God is big. His presence is like gravity. And if there is unholiness in his presence, he will break out. And if there is holiness, a holy pursuit of the fear and presence of God, there will be breakthrough. There's either breakout or breakthrough. But when you come to the presence of God, you don't leave the same. And so David, he experiences the fear of God's presence. Now he responds to God's presence. In fact, we see two responses, David and his wife, Michael. In verse 12, uh, it was told to King David, the Lord has blessed the household where the ark was. Uh, and all that belongs to him because of the ark. So David went up and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. David's, he, he knows that the ark is good. He's not afraid of it, and he wants to go get it again. Verse 13, when those who bore the ark of the Lord, we imagine this time in the right way with the poles on their shoulders, when they had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod, a priestly garments. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Verse 16, and as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, his, this is his wife, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Jump down to verse 20. And David 
returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honoring himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants as one of the vulgar fellows, shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all of his, uh, all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. That's who I was dancing before, God and God's people. And I will celebrate before the Lord. In fact, I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. There's two responses here to the presence of God. David is leaping and dancing, right? Leaping and dancing. Again, I've seen grown men dance at a wedding, Right? On, you know, loosen the tie, uh, grab a drink on the dance floor, dance at a wedding, grown men in a suit, dancing. And then the next morning at church, just, you know, this, emotionless. All right, this is an appropriate response. David has a, an appropriate response. In fact, he says, I, I, would, I would be more contemptible than even this. Uh, some of your translations, more undignified. He's reckless. David is being reckless in his worship. He does not care what anybody else thinks. He is not concerned at all about anyone else. He is just dancing before the Lord, recklessly worshiping before the Lord. Psalm 2 says that we are to rejoice with trembling. That's the right response to God. We both fear him and we celebrate him. We both fear him and we rejoice in him. He's leaping and dancing before the Lord. But Michael, she does not do this. Michael's eyes were on people while David's eyes were on God. Michael is concerned with outward appearances and how things look and proper decorum. David isn't concerned with any of that. He's just consumed with the presence of God. Michael thinks going to church is a public event that you have to prepare for and get ready for, and so she dresses to impress because she thinks the world is her runway. David recognizes that the world is the runway for the glory of God. Michael is worshiping aware that everyone is watching, David instead is lost in wonder and praise and is completely self-forgetful. He, he's not even aware of himself. He's, it's, just, it's just God. He's just worshiping God. Michael's uh, singing with her eyes wandering, wondering what other people might think. You probably won't experience the presence of God in any sort of real way if you're holding on to your dignity is the idea. If you're holding up, that's why I say, what I said earlier, when I pray on my knees, that's when I've felt the presence of God before. There's something about the, the loss of dignity of a grown man on his knees. I mean, I'm a grown man on my knees asking God to move in such a way because I've come to the end of myself. That's the posture. If we are if we are holding on to any sort of dignity, we will not sense, we will not experience the presence of God. You will always have God at arm's length and you will never have the fullness of him and that's what he wants for you. That's my divine jealousy for you, but it won't happen if you're trying to keep it all together. It won't happen if you're trying to look good. It won't happen if you care what other people think. That's not how this works. We might experience the presence of God if we know that there's grace in the face of a beautiful and scary God who loves us and invites us to come into his presence. Rejoice with trembling. David is saying, be reckless in your worship. In fact, we won't taste of God's presence unless we seek it. And this is one of the truths, um, the main truths that I want us to know and that I think is so important to realize. I, I feel like I was telling my, my, my daughter in her soccer game yesterday, uh, this is a bad analogy, I'm sorry, but I just thought of it, so I'm gonna say it. Uh, you know, I, uh, I bribe her. If she scores a goal, I give her money, okay? Because, you know, I was a professional athlete. Like, you get paid, if you play, play well, you get paid. So I was like, baby, $10 if you score today, right? $10. And, uh, <laughs> and at one point I yelled, I said, I said, they're not gonna give it to you, you have to take it. In the same way, like God's presence, here's how God's presence works. It's not going to be typical that it just comes upon you. You have to take it, okay? This is just a biblical reality, a biblical truth. In Psalm 27, David, he's talking about that, right? In Psalm 27, uh, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Right, he's afraid, he's anxious. He's in his prayer journal, he's saying, I'm feeling afraid. 
And then in verse two, uh, evildoers assail me. They're surrounding him. People are after him. Okay, so he, he's recognizing that there's enemies around him. But then verse three, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. He says, yet I will be confident, right? Unshaken. I'm unshaken despite my fear and anxiety. I'm unshaken despite the fact that I think that there's enemies surrounding me. Why? Right? Why, is he, why is he unshaken? Because he knows the presence and power of God. So verse four, verse four is famous verse in Psalm 27. There's one thing that I've asked. Right? In his prayer time, he doesn't say, God, rid, get, get rid of the enemies. He doesn't say, take away my fear. I don't, want to fear, I, don't, I don't fear anxious anymore. God, will you do this? Will you do that? No, he says one thing. There's one thing that I have asked uh, that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to be in the presence of God all the days of my life and I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Right? They, they, David is saying, I just want to be in the presence of God. Later in verse seven, God says, seek my face. So what is God's command to us in Psalm 27? Seek my face. Seek my presence. I want you to come take it. I want you to seek my face. This is how I've designed this relationship to be. This is how I've designed this thing to be, that you would seek me. All right, James 4, verse 8, draw near to God and what? He will draw near to you. 2 Chronicles 15, 2, if you seek him, he will be found by you. Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. God wants us to come after him. God's presence follows our pursuit. God inhabits the space that we make for him. God moves when we make room. God comes where he's wanted. There's something about there's something about us walking into a place or falling on our knees and, and, again, opening up our hands, surrendering whatever we have, and telling God, I'm making space for you because that's what I want. I want you in my presence. That he just honors and desires. That's a fascinating, fascinating reality that the God of the universe invites us to himself. That is the testimony of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. That he would invite you and me we have no business being in the presence of God. But in his grace, he would invite you and me into his presence. He wants us to seek him. David, he says in Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you. Psalm 63, he says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. God's presence follows our pursuit. This is why you have saints of old over the course of history speaking in this way. John Calvin, he said, let us therefore labor more to feel, feel. This is Calvin. Not know, feel Christ living in us. Let us labor to feel him in us. Uh, John Owen, labor therefore to feel your hearts and fill your hearts with the cross of Christ. Jonathan Edwards, we should labor to be continually growing in divine love. Right? We fight for it, we seek it, we pursue it, we labor for it. We run after the presence of God. Right? To really experience God, it's almost unexplainable to others. Right? When you've actually tasted of it, uh, it's hard to describe to other people. The best way you can do it is just say, you need, you need to seek him yourself. Um, Blaise Pascal, uh, he's this, he was this math, you know, brain, brain, brainy dude, mathematician, famous mathematician in the uh, 16th or 17th century. Super, super bright dude. Uh, there's a great book called, um, well, it's Pascal's Pensies, but uh, uh, there's a, a, a scripture, um, modern spirituality. There's a great book about pe uh, Pascal, but it's just brainy, right? Philosophical. But he had this one moment and he wrote the moment down and he actually sewed it into his jacket so he would already always have this moment. This moment where he describes the presence of God. This is what he said. He said, the year of grace, 1654, Monday, the 23rd, November. From about half past 10 in the evening until half past midnight, fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, 
not of philosophers and scholars, certainty, certainty, heartfelt, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ. My God and your God, the world forgotten and everything except God. Joy, 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 tears of joy, the fountain of living waters. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, let me never be cut off from him. I don't even know what that means. He's just writing about the presence of God. Jonathan Edwards, he had a similar experience in the year 1737 in divine contemplation and prayer. I had a view that for me was extraordinary of the glory of the Son of God as mediator between God and man and his wonderful, great, full, pure, and sweet grace and love and meek and gentle condensation. The person of Christ appeared to me ineffably excellent with an excellency great enough to swallow up all thought and conception, which continued as near as I can judge about an hour, which kept me the greater part of the time in a flood of tears, weeping aloud. I felt an ardency of soul to be what I know, not otherwise how to express, but just emptied and annihilated to lie in the dust and to just to be full of Christ alone to love him with a holy and pure love, to trust in him, to live upon him, to serve and follow him, and to be perfectly sanctified and made pure with the divine and heavenly purity. Fellas especially, man, these weren't, these weren't soft men. David killed freaking Goliath. Jonathan Edwards was the president of Yale. Pascal was this brainy mathematician. Right? If, 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 they would, you know, if they were here today, they'd be cheering on younger, more fit men in tights playing with the ball but they experienced the presence of God and fell in a puddle of tears on the floor. Have you ever tasted that? Have you ever had that? God's presence follows our pursuit. Here's the great promise of the gospel in all of this, um, and it also becomes a challenge for us because if this might be true of the Old Testament, how much more in the new? that we can experience the presence of God. But the, the promise of the gospel is that we can now approach his throne with confidence. Right, Hebrews 4, it's talking about Jesus as our priest, that it's Jesus who, he, he mediates for us, he takes our sin, like the priest did, into the holiest place. And if we're united to Jesus by faith, we can then, approach the throne of God's grace with boldness. That you and I, even more so, if that's possible, even more so, God invites us into his presence. We can have great confidence and little fear. There's a a weightiness, a gravity to the presence of God, even for the Christian in the New Testament, even for the Christian in Christ, but not fear of death. We, we, we can approach God's throne in Christ and know, know that we're accepted. Know that we're welcomed. Know that in him we are holy and the holy can be with the, the holy of holies. It's a great gospel promise. Will you come? Will you pursue the presence of God? In the presence of God, there is great power. There's great power. We wanted to show you this story, um, and then I'll, I'll come back and, and talk about what our response to today might be. So check out this video real quick. Part of me feels like surely that couldn't have happened in my life, you know? Me playing a part of that story Like really, we just like put ourselves in his path. Even if it's hard for us to imagine, it requires so little faith. My name's Charlie Knapp, and uh, I've been coming to Paradox since April of 2023. We went to the stakeholder gathering in May. When we first got there, I was on a run and just praying for our time together. Specifically, what was on my heart is that people would encounter God and that lives would be changed. Later in the evening when we were worshiping, I felt like I had a picture 
just like a mental impression, like a Twizzler shaped pretzel type thing. The next similar type of impression was of a back, the right side of the back kind of along the spine. So after worship, I just went up to James and told him kind of what I described and what I felt like I saw. And he, he was like, okay, well, the room was kind of clearing out, the worship was over. And so he was like, well, why don't we pray on it tonight and sleep on it? And then we can uh, ask and see if that resonates with anybody. I left the worship night and was just very embarrassed. I was like, gosh, I knew I shouldn't have brought that up. Like that was probably just some random thing. It's an occupational hazard. Uh, I, I work in a cath lab where I wear lead uh, sometimes for five, six hours at a time. And lots of people in my profession that have had back pain, some have had to quit their jobs, some have had to have surgery. My name is Paul Grayburn. I'm a partner here at Paradox. My wife is Rose Hyken. We've been married uh, 44 years. His back pain level on most days was an eight. Even if he was fudging on that number or wasn't not being exact about that, I'm going, really? Because your face is saying it's an eight? And I have prayed, I have prayed and prayed and prayed. I don't want to see him in pain. Saturday morning, uh, we went to worship in the chapel and Pastor James said, you know, last night, uh, someone came up to me and said, someone here at this meeting is suffering from severe back pain. When I heard that, it kind of made me cringe because I was like, oh gosh, I'm gonna look like an idiot here. So I tried to escape as quickly as I could out the back. I have to say that if, if I were at, you know, 11 o'clock service at Paradox, uh, I would not have come forward. I would have thought, it's somebody else. You know, there's 700 people in here. It's probably somebody else. Back pain is common. But there we were with 30 people in the small chapel, and I just knew it was me. When I heard those words, I knew it was my husband. And if he wasn't going to go on his own, then I was going to make sure that he did because I... I knew it was for him. I knew the word was for him. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit telling me, but it was also my wife nudging me with her hip, saying, get up there, get up there, it's you. My wife tapped me on the arm and was like, look up there. And I turned around and James was praying over someone at the front who had gone up. James and, and uh, Chris Holder uh, laid hands on me, prayed, uh, put their hands on my lower back where it hurt, and the pain went away. He comes up to sit down next to me. And of course, I want to know what, what's happening, where your pain level. And he said, it is zero. And I just, are you serious? And he said, yes, it's zero. I feel nothing. When I saw that, it kind of, you know, struck my heart and was just very encouraging. It wasn't foolish for me to, to bring that up and to, to act on it. That kind of just opened my eyes to like, it's so much bigger and greater because it's for other people. My wife and I, uh, you know, prayed privately, you know, for healing for my back. You know, nothing had happened. But being there, Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be also. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of Jesus. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's opened my eyes to that. Obedience and faith doesn't necessarily mean either that I'm fully convinced and know what's going to happen. Let him work his power within us and among us. He is present and that, that things beyond your wildest dreams can happen when the people of God come together in faith and the Holy Spirit is present. Uh, here, here's what I want to do. I, I want to invite you um, to seek the presence of God, uh, to be reckless. I don't know what that means for you. I don't know what that looks like for you. If you think about your life of faith and, and the way in which you have typically worshiped and responded to God, um, you think about all the ways in which we can worship uh, in our song in our prayers, uh, in our, our giving, um, in our faith. 
Have you been playing it safe? Or have you been reckless? Um, we, James alluded to this, we, we took out the front row. I just, I wanted to give a little bit more space up here because I think for some of you, that means uh, coming up here uh, as a sort of altar, as a sort of ark, drawing near to the presence of God and just being in it, sitting in it, kneeling in it, uh, being before it. Uh, one of the most profound times that I've felt the presence of God was at the Ridgely Theater where we, and that, man, that place was nasty. It's dirty. And we did the same thing. And I, my wife and I came up to the stage or whatever, you know, and just had a moment before the Lord. And so it, it's not the place. Uh, it's your heart and a big God who loves to be sought after. Um, some of you couldn't sing this morning. You walked in here and you just couldn't sing. Uh, your reckless step of obedience, your reckless faith might just be opening your mouth, singing and believing. Um, for some of you, 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 you need to be healed. And, and like Paul, you might never would walk forward on a Sunday. We do this every Sunday. This is one of many, many Sundays, or I'm sorry, one of many, many stories. Uh, I was there that night. Uh, the, the presence of God was in that place. Uh, and so we knew something was going to happen. It always happens. And, and like Paul, you know, if this was on a Sunday morning, I would never come forward. And what if you were supposed to come forward? We pray for healing every Sunday. What if, you, what if that's your reckless response to the presence of God? Um, this is a moment to step out in faith, believe in a God of breakthrough, and to seek his presence. And so, Father God, we... We ask that you would do this. Uh, you would meet us in this place. Uh, we, we seek you. You've asked us to seek your face. Here we are. We seek your face. Um, not because we're great, but because Jesus is great. We ask that you would receive us and move among us in great power by your presence. It's in his name we pray. Amen.